morning and welcome to worship at Ottawa Reform. We are glad that you are with us this morning. Um, I hope as you were um, listening to those words as we were um, singing the preparing your hearts for worship. Spirit of God, breathe on your church. Pour out your presence. Speak through your word. We pray in every nation, Christ be known. Our hope and our salvation, Christ alone. Amen? Amen. If you are able, would you stand? Would you give a hello to those semi around you? And then remain standing. We're going to sing a couple songs together.
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending the greatest gift into this earth that the earth will ever see. The co-creator with you from the beginning, your son, your only son, Jesus Christ, gave up his heavenly perfect home to come here to show your love. Not to say it, but to show it. Giving his life for everyone who would believe in his name. What a powerful name it is. Lord, we're gathered in your name. Would you bless this place? Now showering us with your Holy Spirit, open our minds to sing together, to pray together, to worship together, to open your word, to hear from you this morning. So we go out into that world a changed person. All this we pray and ask in Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen. Now grace and mercy and peace be unto us from God our Father and His Son Jesus Christ all through the operation of the Holy Spirit and God's people said, thank you. You may be seated. Miss Ann, <laughs> we have never met other than saying hi over there. So you do all your introductions for us. Um, a week prior to a special offering, we have the, the uh, person representing that offering coming. Welcome to Ottawa. Good morning, Ottawa Reformed Church. It is a pleasure to be here this morning, and I extend blessings and thank you. Hi, Vani. Sorry. Had to say hi when I see a familiar face. Um, from Servants Community Church in Grand Rapids. My name is Ann Hurdy, and I am a elder at Servants Community Church, and I've been part of Servants for 25 years now. I'm going to apologize ahead of time. My hand, as you can see, is trembling. I have a neurological condition, and I apologize. It's just really out of control lately. I am not nervous. I actually love to talk in front of people. <laughs> so I apologize. I'm going to hold it with two hands because literally it's just out of control today. So anyway, um, things that servants have been looking a little bit different. Obviously, we've all been under that stay-at-home order, but we have continued to engage in worship in a lot of meaningful and different ways. We've been sending out... DVDs, and we've been doing online worship, we've done Zoom meetings, we've done prayer meetings, and all sorts of stuff that way. Families have also still gotten the children's bulletins so that families can enjoy those too. Today, we are actually back at worship like you. Uh, we're doing two services. Our church is not near as big as yours, so some people may say it feels silly to do two worship services, but like you, we're doing every other row, and uh, we're really excited to be back at church. So, the other thing that normally happens at Servants Church is on Wednesday evenings, we have a Wednesday evening meal together, family style. Well over 100 people come. It's a wonderful opportunity. Obviously, given everything happening, we have not been able to do that the same. However, due to a very dedicated group of volunteers, we have still been providing to-go dinners every Wednesday night. So families can still come, get a to-go box for dinner. Some churches and organizations have also donated additional food so, for instance, a couple weeks ago, each family who came also got a banana box full of groceries. And so we've been really thankful and appreciative for the ways in which we've been able to continue to reach our neighbors, to be a voice in our neighborhood, and to continue to gather together in that much different way. We are looking forward, though, to reinstating our weekly women's Bible study and men's Bible study. We know that those have been a blessing to people, and obviously those haven't happened um, because lots of individuals in our community don't have Zoom internet, laptops, those other sorts of things. So we're excited, though, to be able to get back together in person. The one other disappointment, although it is necessary right now, is normally during the month of June, in two weeks, we would do our fine arts camp. That is our version of Vacation Bible School. We encourage children from our neighborhood and from our church community to come together, and we have an opportunity to encourage them to see their gifts, their abilities, and how much they can use those gifts and artistic abilities in order to praise, provide praise and worship to God. So we're very sad that we are not going to be able to do that this year. Um, but again, due to all the circumstances, we've decided it's probably not easy and not encouraged to have that many children all together in one room. So, But we do look forward to re resurrecting that again next year. So again, on behalf of Servants Community Church, we are so thankful and so much value all of the partnerships that we have, including here at Ottawa Reformed Church. Um, after church, I will be out back or maybe outside or somewhere. I will be available. Um, I would love to have the chance to talk to you a little bit more, share a little bit more about what's happening at Servants. 
I do have copies of our spring newsletter, so if people would like to see a copy of that, we'd love to share that. And I'd also be more than welcoming of putting you on a mailing list so that you can get future copies of our newsletter. So again, thank you so much for this opportunity for me to be here. Thank you for your continued partnership. We greatly appreciate it. In the back, thank you. Just a couple announcements, and uh, I have Ken on here, but Ken's actually with us. Ken will be having surgery once again. As some of you know, Ken Merriman had an amputation of uh, part of his foot. Uh, the sore has not closed, and they need another surgery. Um, Kenny will be with you in the hospital, and uh, we really covet all your prayers, please. Uh, this is getting serious. It's a long rehabilitation. We need to pray for God to really put that foot back together and get it. And we have a new member of our church. Um, congratulations to Tanya and Kevin Koiker in the birth of Barrett. Three boys, all starting with B now, and <laughs> I love it. We have welcome and will welcome those babies and everyone with wide open arms. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, this is such a privilege. We know that we can pray alone. In fact, there's parts of your word that says go in a closet and pray. I understand that. But there's other parts in your word that talks about both Old and New Testament where the church came together in corporate prayer. There's something special about this. We are joined together as the body of Jesus Christ, united in Jesus Christ through your Holy Spirit. And we lift these prayers to you. It is so encouraging during the week that we get emails or we get calls and say, we know that your church still has congregational prayer. Would you pray for us by name? We're going to do that this morning, Lord. We pray that you would be with Tom Aving, Aving. Just please bless him. Strengthen that heart, please. We pray that you would be with Sue. Lord, we just pray that these, again, these, uh, these treatments would, would not be so devastating on her and they would have great effect soon, if not right away. We pray that you would be with Jerry Hookham, my dear God, as he's being transferred now to Mary Freebed. What a wonderful hospital this is. Lord, we thank you for providing for that, and may you give him wonderful care and healing. Again, for our team, Cindy and Roger Jacobs, we thank you, dear God. We, we pray that as they continue to go through treatments together, it's so beautiful to see their love for one another, their love for this church, their love for their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so far, Lord, we continually thank you for their incredible healing. We do pray for Jay. This has been now three or four weeks where he has just simply said, I don't want any more treatments. I'm ready to go home. I, I, I just don't want to fight anymore here. I want to go to my Lord. Dear God, graciously and lovingly, if you want to give him more life so he can be a testimony, wonderful. If you decide to take him home, we pray that you would do that so gently and beautiful as a testimony to his love for you. We pray that you would be with Larry Smith, dear God, with that Huntington's disease as it continues to debilitate him more and more and more. Please help him, especially his wife as she cares for, her, uh, cares for him. For Chris, a long road yet. We thank you for sparing his life. What a terrible, terrible accident. Lord, we pray as the skin grafts and other plastic surgery needs to be done, as he also soon will go to Mary Freebed, we pray for your blessing there. Heavenly Father, we're not meeting with Kids Hope, but we're still writing our children. Some of us are even able to call them. We pray this week that you will be with Bev and with Gazelle, that you will be with Cindy again and, and Giovanni, that you would be with Andy, who's here with us this morning, and Gavino. Dear God, just bless them. Bless their relationship. May we bring the love and care of Christ to those kids. Lord, we do pray for our military here. Those members of, of our church, we pray that you would be with Daniel and Jason, with Chris and Robin, with Ryan and Logan, and we pray for the military of our country. Right now, we're trying to navigate which direction to go with, with that protection or that guarding, whatever it may be, Lord. We pray that we would give those who are commanding our our troops, what to do and how to do it, how to do it well. We don't know. We're, we're guiding into areas that we've never been before. Give this country wisdom, please. We pray that you would be with the missionary of the month, that you would be with Grace Covenant Ministries, and we thank you for Anne this morning. As she represents a servant's community church in Grand Rapids, we have been beside them for years, if not decades, and we pray your blessing on them. Lord, we pray that 
that they would be able to get together soon, that the coming together and worship like we're trying to do would be a real uplifting part of their ministry. Bless her, and she apologized for her no-logical condition. Lord, heal that. We pray, Lord, that you would be with her. Never need to apologize. We thank you for all that she does for that church and in her life. Dear God, we pray that you would be with Ken Merriman as he's walked in this morning into church knowing that he's hurting. Dear God, bless him and help him. Please heal that foot we're asking and begging you. We thank you for a brand new little baby, a healthy baby. We pray for Barrett. We pray that you would be with Tanya and Kevin. And we pray for this whole church, for those little children that you've given to us, that we would raise them, love them, care for them, teach them, help them, guide them, <laughs> and love them. And dear God, we do lift our, our country and really the world. We look on our TV sets and pretty soon you almost want to turn it off. You, you hurt. We do not need to fill this world with hatred. I pray that hate is not the way that we get things done. We pray that we would do it through prayer, that we would do it through the beauty. I, I watched one thing this, this week as many people, and I don't know if they're all Christians, but surrounded buildings, laying their hands on it and praying. There's where change will begin. And we pray, Lord, that we would be part of that change. Change our hearts where they need to be changed. We pray, Lord, that Christians would lead the way, not follow and Heavenly Father, finally, I just pray for any needs in this congregation that we don't know. Right now, and isn't it beautiful? You can look in the minds and hearts of every single person sitting here. You know exactly what they need. Would you please come into their lives, helping them, healing them, guiding them, and directing them as well. Dear God, we thank you so much for the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we lift these prayers, not because we're worthy of anything that we prayed, but as we sang already, we come in the beautiful, wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I think we have a couple kids up here. If we do, kids, we have something up here with a couple suckers. If you'll come up and join us, I got to entice them by the suckers, you know. Oh, we do have a couple. I think. <laughs> come on up. Good morning. Good morning. You can come right in the middle. I think. Come here. Come here. <laughs> you don't have to be so far away. Good morning. How are you? You know, we're going to start a new piece of God's word. You see that man over there? That's Pastor Jim. And he's going to be preaching on to you. It's called the Beatitudes. It's called blessed are you. You're blessed when you are Poor in spirit. Now, that's a big word that your mom and dad are going to understand pretty soon. But what it means is you are blessed by God when you're humble. Now, where are you going to be humble? Let's see what I got in the bag today. What is that? It's just a can of, that's right, it's just a can of soup. What it's going to represent is the food that we have. All of you are able to go home and have food. But rather than saying, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine, I'm going to think about something. Ask yourself once in a while, is there somebody out there that I can help and bring some food to them? To humble yourself means not to just keep for yourself, but to humbly give some food to others. Let's see what else I got in the bag. Oh, you'll like this one. What's that? Yeah, they know that one a lot better than soup. Um, there's going to be times when you're going to start getting an allowance and you say, oh, good, I've got my allowance. Or you can also say, can part of this go to other kids that don't have quite so much? To humble yourselves means, can I think a little bit about others and what they need? Put that one down. How about this one? You all know what this one is. What is that? That's right. We know what that is. That represents the work we do. All of you and all of these people can do some work. And yes, we have to do work for ourselves and keep everything going and running well. But there's a time you say, what work could I probably help with others? One more. If I can find it in here. <laughs> What's this? It's a watch. It represents our time. Would you take some time every day? Your parents are listening so they can help you to pray for others to humble and say, Lord, not only give me, give me, would you help other people and help them to love you and help me to love them? Kids, be humble.
thinking always, not just about ourselves, but about others. Can you hold your hands and close your eyes, and we're going to pray. Lord, I thank you that you've given all of us here, I think, enough food and money and abilities and time that we would oftentimes, as Christian children, just begin to think about, are there other children, are there other people that I know that I can help? Lord, help us to humble ourselves before you, thinking of others sometimes before even ourselves. I love these children this morning. We give them to you in Jesus' name. And God's children said, you may go back to your seats. You are awesome. Thank you.
Beatitudes, I thought we should show that video of how blessed we truly are. Let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Lord, bless us now. You say your word says that we are blessed. That not that we will be blessed, that someday we, we, we might be blessed, but that we are blessed. So Lord, over the next few weeks as we talk about your Beatitudes, Lord, may we have the attitude of being blessed by you. So Lord, bless this word today. Speak to our hearts, speak to our minds. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Could you grab me that stand right there just because uh, I need it this morning? Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to try to avoid some of these suckers up here. Um, I might step on a few because I might get a little out of control because I get out of control when I get to talk about God's word and uh, specifically how blessed we are. The sermon title is The End of My Rope. And uh, it's based on Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Jesus walks to the, this, uh, this mountain, and he begins to preach to his disciples. And, and it's part of what's called the Sermon on the Mount. And it's a fairly lengthy message. It goes chapters 5, 6, and 7 of the book of Matthew. At the end of my rope, and it's based on this particular verse, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Let's take this apart this morning. Blessed. What does it mean to be blessed? Notice I took out the words. The text says, blessed are the poor in spirit. I took out and just said, blessed. Blessed. Because you know, Jesus, he spoke in Aramaic. You think he's speaking Hebrew or Greek. But no, he spoke in Aramaic. And Aramaic is a combination of really those two languages. It's kind of a, a Hebrew language, but it's been heavily influenced by Greek. Blessed, he says. And in the Aramaic, there is no verb here. It's just blessed. Just blessed. That's it. Blessed. Blessed, the poor in spirit. There is no are the it's just blessed, poor in spirit. In other words, it's an exclamation mark. Blessed. Not that you might someday be blessed. Not that there's a promise of blessing. Not that there's blessed, you know, someday in the future. No, it's, it's blessed right now. You are blessed by God. Blessed. So, the Gloppers... Oh, yeah, you're in the splash zone. Yes. You are blessed, right? So, as Christians, you are what? Say it a little louder. Okay. Gearman's right back there. You are what? Blessed. That's right. That's who else should I pick on? Oh, the Beacus is right over here. As Christians, you are what? Blessed, right. Right, oh, there's the Hintz family right over there. As Christians, you are what? Yes, who can I pick on way over there? Oh, the whole Emmer clan right over here in the front row. As Christians, you are what? Blessed, that's right. Church, as Christians, you are what? Blessed. Amen, you are blessed. That's what Jesus says. As followers of him, you are blessed, exclamation mark, right? That's what he's saying here. You are blessed. It's part of your DNA. It's who you are as Christians. I put a little DNA symbol up there, right? Because as Christians, it's part of who we are. The word blessed there in Greek is makaira. I knew I was going to mess that up. It gets stuck someplace in there. Makarios. And what it means, basically, it means happy. But it's not just, I don't know, today in our culture today, when we say happy, happiness kind of comes and goes depending on how I feel. Happiness comes and goes depending on what's, what circumstances I'm in. Happiness kind of comes and goes depending on the situation that I'm in. This is, this is a sense of happy 
that is independent of the circumstance. It's independent of the situation. I am happy no matter what I'm going through. It's a sense of, of joy. You know the difference between happiness and joy? joy happiness kind of, it's, well, I'm happy today, but maybe not tomorrow. But joy, the biblical concept of joy is that we are joyful no matter what. That's why Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Even in his imprisonment, Paul was joyful. There's an island off, of, uh, off the coast of, of Israel called Cyprus. It was called the, the happy island or the joyful island. Because no matter what happened to these people, the island seemed genuinely happy. People seemed to be happy. And it was kind of like, I don't know, you meet people from Jamaica, they seem to be kind of happy, don't they? Maybe it's because the sun shines all the time there, and they just have a nice island. I don't know, but Cyprus was the same way. The people were full of joy. Despite what happened, despite the storms, despite whatever happened, people seemed to be genuinely happy. This is that concept, this blessed. You know, years ago when I worked at church in California, there was, there was a, there was a, there was a, I had a receptionist in my office. Her name was Joy. That was her name. She was joyful all the time. She was genuinely joyful. She, she would just answer the phone for me. That's all she would do. She'd pick up the phone and, and she would, you know, say, you've got Dr. Poit's office. What can I do for you today? But she would do it with such a great sense of joy. And, and one time <laughs> I heard her pick up the phone and she didn't seem quite as joyful, but even in the midst of the circumstance, she seemed genuinely caring and joyful. All of a sudden, she takes the phone and she bangs it on the desk. And I, I'm thinking, what on earth? And, and then all of a sudden, I hear her now say, now, young man, if, 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 you, wouldn't, if you would know Jesus, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be saying these kinds of things. If you honestly love Christ or you honestly had your life changed by Jesus, you wouldn't be saying these kinds of things. And she's like, so let me pray for you. And she starts to pray on the phone. And after she hung up, I, I kind of walked down and I said, Joy, what's, what's going on? And she says, oh, she says, this young man, I don't know, all of a sudden, he starts calling and he's using inappropriate language and he's kind of yelling and he's screaming on the phone and he's, saying that he doesn't believe in Jesus, and man, some of the foul language he, that he's using. And I said, this guy calls often. She says, yeah, so I start banging on the, the desk to get his attention, and then I tell him about Jesus, and then I, I pray for him. I said, what are you doing exactly? She says, I'm doing evangelism. That's what she said. And I'm like, she was genuinely a joyful person. She is blessed. That's the word here. Now, let's move on. The poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. There's two Greek words here for poor in spirit. The word poor basically can mean like the working poor. Those people who, they have enough to get by, but there is no real surplus. They, they, they have just enough to survive, but they're not, they don't have a lot of money, and they would consider themselves poor. We have a lot of people that are like that in our world. They, they have enough to get by, but they're not wealthy in any means. The other word for, for, poor, for poor, this means someone who is completely destitute without any basic necessities of all, at all. They have nothing. They are destitute. They're also deprived of wealth, of influence, position, honor. They're completely left out. Then there's the depleted. They're helpless. They're powerless. They are also, what I would say, they're desperate. They have become beggars. They have become so dependent upon everybody else around them that they have to beg for what little they have. It's interesting. This is the word that Jesus uses in this context. 
Blessed are the destitute. Blessed are the deprived. Blessed are the depleted. Blessed are the desperate. Blessed is the person, in other words, who is at the end of their rope. They have nowhere else to turn. They're, they're done for. That's pretty poor. That's what Jesus says when he uses this word, blessed are the desperate. Let me give you two examples from the Bible of, of people who are desperate. From, from basically from um, Luke chapter 8, starting with verse 40, there's two examples I want to show you of, of an example of this blessed are the poor in spirit. This is Luke chapter 8, starting with verse 40. Here we go. Now, when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. This man, Jairus, what do we know about him? He was a father, right? It says that he had a daughter, his only daughter, who was 12 years old, and he was a leader, it says. What does it say? That he was a, he, 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 he was a ruler of the synagogue. This man, he was a father, but more than that, he was, a, he was a community leader. Not just a religious leader, he was a leader in the, in the community. He was, a, he was a leader of leaders. He was a leader in the, the local religious community as well. And so he had, what I like to say is a reputation. He had position, he had influence, he had power. But what does the text say? It says that he fell at Jesus' feet. Can you imagine this leader of leaders coming to, to fall at the feet of this, this poor itinerant preacher who's going from town to town, preaching, teaching, healing, but he's kind of an outcast, this, this man named Jesus. What does he do? He goes, Jairus goes, and he, he falls at Jesus' feet. That, that, my friends, was a sign of, of desperation. His daughter was dying. And so he, he was desperate. He was, in other words, at the end of his rope. He was willing to res, risk everything in order to, to, to ask Jesus. It says that he implored Jesus. Can you imagine can you imagine this, this person that's in the community, this leader of leaders, all of a sudden, he, if you're standing there and, and you're thinking, oh, I don't know if I believe in this Jesus or not, and then all of a sudden you see the leader, the leader of your local synagogue come out, fall on his feet and implore Jesus, please, please, Jesus, I, I beg of you, come to my home for my daughter is dying. In other words, he was desperate. He went from reputation to desperation, right? Then there's another, if we continue the story, as Jesus, it says, went along, the crowd pressed around him. Here we see a, a curious crowd. They press around him, but that's all we know about the crowd. They, they didn't really, they just pressed in around him because maybe they just wanted to know. Who is this Jesus? We hear that he's running around preaching, teaching, and healing people. So they all press in around him. The crowd was there, but not really committed. Not like this particular woman. This woman comes along, it says in verse 43, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on, living on physicians... She could not be healed by anyone. 
she came up behind Jesus and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you are, are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, someone touched me. For I perceive that the power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was, she, was, she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. It's fascinating. I, I had never noticed this before until this week. As I was reading this text, do you notice how the daughter was 12 years old? Jairus' daughter was 12 years old. And this woman comes to Jesus. And how long has she been sick? 12 years. The full length of the daughter's life, she had been sick. So you've got basically two daughters, right? Jesus calls her daughter. And so you have this woman. And as someone who's had this, this problem, this illness, it says basically she was, she was excluded from the community. She was ignored by the community. She was told that she was basically unacceptable to God because no one wanted to touch her. No one wanted to be with her. No one, she was one of the things that was untouchable. And notice when it says that when Jesus said, who touched me, it says that Basically, she came out of hiding. She was hidden by the community. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if, if the community, the, the crowd that day, would have known that she was in the crowd? This untouchable woman that no one should be able to touch, or they would be considered unclean as well. Here she comes, and she gently works her way through the crowd, they would have ostracized her. They would have tossed her out. They would have excluded her. They would have rejected her. She, she was humiliated. She was abandoned. And here Jesus notices her. When she could no longer be hidden, what does he do? He, he, he allowed her to touch him. The story continues. Well, let me just do this. The crowd was uncommitted. This woman, she was submitted. She was submitted to Christ. She went from the crowd being not committed to being submitted. The story goes on. It goes on, and, and Jesus goes to Jairus' house, and he reaches out, and he touches the daughter. And the daughter is raised from the dead. And everyone is completely amazed. Here are two stories, two stories of people who were desperate. They were desperate. They were at what we would say at the end of their rope. That's exactly what it means to be poor in spirit. People who are desperate enough that all they have left is to trust in God. All they have left is to, is to, is to reach out to Jesus. These people who are poor in spirit, they're not just simply quiet people. They're not simply introverted people. They're not simply weak people. They're not self-demeaning people. That's not what it means to be in poor in spirit. When we think of poor in spirit or being humble, we think of maybe a person who's quiet. We think of maybe a person who's introverted. We may think of a person who's weak. We may think of a person who's self-demeaning. Oh, poor me. Being poor in spirit is none of that. It's not that. It's somebody who is Desperate for Christ. Desperate for Christ. Jesus also said, by the way, he didn't say, blessed is the go-getter. Nope. He didn't say, blessed is the woman who asserts herself, or, or blessed is the man who brags about himself. He didn't say, blessed is the man who's self-confident. He didn't say, blessed is the woman who with high self-esteem. No, he didn't say that, any of that. He said, Blessed, blessed is the person, blessed is the person who is poor in spirit. So what exactly is the definition? Poor in spirit is the humble person, 
who is desperately seeking God. That's the definition. Blessed is the person who is humble and desperately seeking after God. Now, this isn't something that we simply acquire. We don't, we don't acquire it by, oh, 10 steps to being closer to God. We don't acquire it by, by checking off a list. We don't decide to be poor in spirit. No, we simply allow Christ's spirit to move us in such a way that we become desperately a desire to, to love Christ more and more. We don't, we, I say that it's not something that we simply acquire because basically being poor in spirit is knowing that God already exists in our life. Poor in spirit means we already know that God's there. It's a matter of just wanting more of God. We want more of Christ, more of God. Let me give you an example. Psalm 63. The psalmist says, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. Notice how the psalmist starts out. Recognizing, God, you're already my God. But I earnestly seek you. I want more of you in my life. My soul thirsts for you to the point where my flesh just faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I realize this is Michigan, and you folks know about water. But these people lived in a desert, right? They don't know anything about water. I mean, water is kind of a, it's there, but, but it's a dry and weary land where there is no water. And you can imagine the, the thirst for it. This person knows God, and yet they want more of God. Here's another example. My soul longs, yes, faints for the presence of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. My question for you this morning is, your, are you fainting for God? Are you so desperate for Christ? Are you so desperate that, that all you want is God in your life? That's what Jesus is saying. That kind of desperation, that kind of desire for God. Jairus knew it when he, when he put everything aside. He put everything aside to go and seek for Jesus. This woman, this unclean woman, she knew it. She knew that desperation when she put everything aside, all the humiliation, all the, the rejection. She put everything aside to run after Jesus and to go and just simply touch him. I can imagine her her, her walking through the crowd, her walking through the crowd and, and knowing that if anybody recognized her, if anybody saw her, she would be thrown aside. She would be discarded. And yet she went because she was so desperate. It's interesting. I think the lack of desperation for God is absolutely deadly. It's absolutely deadly. Desperation can mean a sense of hopelessness. It can't, desperation can mean a sense of, of distress, anger, pain, agony. It can mean all that. But desperation also means just longing for something so much that you need something so much in your life. That's what this desperation means. The opposite of des des desperation is complacency. When we are not desperate, we become complacent. My friends, I think we live in a society today that, that's not desperate anymore. We're not desperate in this country for God. And we become complacent. C.S. Lewis said this, true faith is never found alone. It is accompanied by expectation. It's a desire to, to, it's expecting to God to really come into your life. The message, you know, it's funny, I occasionally will, will take a, the, my Bibles in my office and I'll look up 
the other verses. And this is what the message says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. I like it. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. Can you imagine Jesus standing there in the Sermon on the Mount saying, blessed Christians, blessed are you when you're at the end of your rope because you have no place else to turn. Blessed are you when you're at the end of your rope. And then he says, well, let me, before I go on, somebody sent me this little thing this week, one of the staff members. And I loved it. God uses broken things. God uses broken things. In other words, when we are at the end of our rope, when we, when we are, have no place else to turn, God uses broken things. It takes broken soil to produce a crop, broken clouds to give rain, broken grain to give bread, broken bread to give strength. It is the broken alabaster box that gives forth perfume. It is Peter weeping bitterly when who returns to greater power than ever. God uses our desperation. God uses our, our brokenness. God wants us right where, he, right, where, where he, right where he's put us. When we're so desperate, all we can do is just turn to him. I like this. The message goes on. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. Think about that for a minute. I think that's exactly what happened with Jairus. That's exactly what happened. When, when there was less of Jairus and more of God, Jairus had the strength to go forward and and plead with Jesus. When there was less of this woman and, and more of Christ, this woman was, had the strength to go forward and plead with Jesus. It says, I put it this way, we need to be, become detached from things. We need to become detached of, from the things of this world. We need to become attached to God. We need to be detached from things, attached to God, have a sense of desperation. And when we do that, then we become dispatched for his kingdom. We have to have this strong need for God. A strong need. That's what it means to be poor in spirit. That's part of our DNA to be seeking God, to be desperate for Christ in our life. And when we are, we can finally become dispatched for his kingdom. Many of you know that I teach for Fuller Theological Seminary out in California. I don't go there. It's an online class. And I finally got, just got a couple more papers I have to grade. And it's interesting. I was reading one of the last papers, and one of my students told a story about from his pastor. He said, my pastor was talking about the Christian DNA, what's part of our, our DNA as Christians. And he said, when he was younger, this pastor, he said, he said I, I kind of ran with the rough, non-Christian crowd. It was before I gave my life to Christ. And, and he said it was during the time of segregation in the country. He said, when, when black students were bussed in to white schools, and he says it was a very turbulent time, and, and it led to a lot of conflict within the school to the point where, he said, one day there was an open brawl at the school. And he said, us kind of wealthier white folks, we all got in our cars after the brawl, and we just went home. He said, but the black students were stuck at the school because the buses drivers refused to take them home. So there, there he were, and, and we all got in the car, and he said, we all went, my non-Christian friends, we all went over to, we all went over to our house, and we're kind of congratulating ourselves and, and thinking how we're going to get back at the black students, he says. And then all of a sudden, he said, a friend of mine showed up, 
And he reminded me that I had just accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior that summer at a Young Life camp. And he said, this Christian friend said, hey, a bunch of us from Young Life are getting together. We're going to go down and we're going to carpool the kids home, the black students. We're going to carpool them home now. You want to come along with us? And this fellow said, he did. He turned to his friends and he said, I got to go. I got to run down and, and pick up some of those black students and I got to take them home. And he said, from that point on, he said, I was ostracized by my non-Christian friends. My non-Christian friends would have nothing to do with me after that. And he says, it was a pretty lonely time in high school. But then he said, worse than that, he said, my Christian friends, he said, my new Christian friends, their parents wouldn't let me hang out with them either because I was now labeled as a bad kid. And he said, it was a very, very lonely time in high school. And this, I tell you the story because this fellow knew that when he began to detach from this world and he began to become attached to God, he was now dispatched for the kingdom of God. The text says this, blessed the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When we are so desperate for Christ, and we become poor in spirit, that is when we inherit the kingdom of God. My question for you is this. Well, it says this, the kingdom of heaven belongs to you if you trust, if you're desperate. My question for you is, have you asked Jesus to make you more desperate? Remember the story of... of uh, Peter in Matthew chapter 14, Jesus sends his disciples out into a boat, right? And all of a sudden there's a storm and, and Jesus isn't with them. They're in this boat and there's a storm. And all of a sudden Jesus comes walking out on the water. And you know what happens? Peter recognizes Jesus and says, Lord, Lord, ask me to come out onto the water. Have me join you. Jesus, Peter was, in other words, Peter was basically saying, Jesus, make me more desperate for you. Jesus, call me out in the storm. Call me out in the water. Call me out there, Lord, and I'll come. So Jesus turns and he says to Peter, come. My question for you, if have you asked Jesus to, to call you out into the storm? Have you asked Jesus to call you out into the water? Have you asked Jesus to make me more vulnerable for you? To make me more desperate for you? To really want you with all my heart, with all my soul? Because if you've done that, if you do that, you're going to be attached to God more and you're going to be dispatched for the kingdom of God. Let's pray. My friends, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be more desperate for you. As a church, help us to be more desperate for you. As individuals, Lord, help us to be more desperate for you. Help us, Lord. Help us to be more attached to you in every way, Lord. To love you with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul. And yes, Lord, to love our neighbor as ourselves. So, Lord, may we truly be blessed because we are desperate, so desperate for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Please rise for the benediction. So, church, you are what? Blessed. blessed, right. Go out into the world. Take that blessing with you. Bless all those around you. Remind them that in Christ, they are blessed as well. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.